Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Conservation Conversations. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for today's conversation on Goliath Roopers. My name is Ed Pritchard, and I work for the Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures Unit. Uh, this webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami Eco Adventures. We will be offering this webinar series every second and fourth Wednesdays at noon for this foreseeable future. So although we can't see you in person right now, we are excited to offer this webinar series and reach even more you know, people than we'd normally be able to um, in one classroom or, or uh, uh, seminar session. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, everyone in this webinar is currently muted. So I ask that you guys remain that way and type any questions that you might have throughout the presentation into the chat box, which you can find um, at a little icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will answer any of the questions that you might have at the end of the session. Uh, the webinar right now is being recorded and we will uh, be sending the link of the recording uh, within the next few days. Um, that way you can share that with um, anyone that wasn't able to join us today. Uh, please follow us on social media, both um, at Miami Eco Adventures and at Miami Dade Sea Grant, um, where we'll be announcing the upcoming conservation topics at the beginning of every month. Um, if you'd like to receive an email reminder with those conservation topics and the registration links for that, you can uh, email Anna, uh, which we'll put her email in the chat box, and uh, you can reach out to her there. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to today's presenter, Anna Zangronis. All right. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all for joining us today. Happy almost end of November, excuse me, end of September, and it's officially fall now here in South Florida. And depending on where you're joining us from, it was a wonderfully light and breezy 85 or so when I woke up this morning and it was just gorgeous. And only in this part of the world would we, would that be considered fall where other parts of at least the US are already wearing coats. So I hope you're enjoying it as much as I have. Let's get this bad boy to click. All right. As Ed mentioned, my name is Ana Sangronis and I am the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent here in Miami-Dade County. And I'm really happy to be here with you all to talk about Goliath Grouper today. And so to do that, I'd like to kick us off and ask you all to test your fish identification skills. And I'm gonna have Ed launch this poll and take your best guess as to which of these fish is a goliath grouper is it a b or c so just use your mouse please to click on the answer and then hit submit and we'll give it a few maybe 30 more seconds so i know we have some experienced water people and anglers on the phone and some folks that are maybe newer to fish id and goliath grouper so you know we don't know who's guessing what so please don't worry about your response. All right, looks like we got everyone. Fantastic, thanks, Ed. So we're gonna go over exactly how to identify, identify these now. And Goliath grouper are actually pretty easy to ID within the grouper family. The first clue that you can use are searching for the presence of bars, and those are vertical bands or stripes on a fish. And the other major clue with the Goliath grouper has to do with the shape of their tail. Goliath grouper have a very rounded paddle shaped tail when compared to a slightly more square edged tail that some of the other grouper like the black grouper have. So if you chose C, you are correct. This is the Goliath grouper. In addition to the vertical banding along its body and that rounded tail, there are, it, the color itself is olive to light and dark browns, and they're covered in black spots across their body. The first set of dorsal fins are shorter than the second set, and all their fins are rounded versus other species, which might have more pointy edged fins. And a little bit about the biology of this fish, as its name suggests, it's the largest grouper in the Atlantic. And that includes the subtropical and tropical waters off of North and South America, even off the coast of West Africa. There was a historical population there 
However, there haven't been any Goliaths documented there in about the last 20 years. So it's thought that that population has since uh, dwindled quite a bit. And these fish can grow up to eight feet long and about 800 pounds. And I like this photo on the right because it gives a good sense of scale. And this Goliath here is probably four to five feet in total length. But I have personally witnessed one that's been about seven feet in length. And it's akin to coming face to face with a little Volkswagen beetle, but underwater. These fish are very slow growing and have a really late reproductive age. They can sometimes, like a lot of other native reef fish species, they might take years to become reproductively mature. And for Goliaths, that can be up to eight years old. And as a result of all of these traits, they are vulnerable to a wide number of threats, both natural and man-made. And that includes overfishing, red tides and harmful algal blooms, cold events, and also loss of their nursery habitat, which is largely red mangroves. Oh, and before I, I wanna just mention that the oldest documented Goliath grouper was aged at about 37 years old, so they can live quite a long time. When it comes to their reproduction, several members of the grouper family are known as protogenous hermaphrodites. In other words, they change sex from female fish to male fish. And so this is largely what they are considered. This is the strategy that they, that they use throughout their life. I shouldn't say strategy, but this is what they are. However, there's also been research to suggest that they are gonochorists, meaning that it's one fish, it's born as one single sex and remains that way its whole life. So either way, it's pretty interesting whether they're protogenous hermaphrodites or they remain the same sex their whole life. And these fish gather in large numbers for big spawning aggregations, which I'll discuss a little bit later. The lifestyle goliath grouper is pretty interesting. During spawning, the females release eggs while the males release sperm into open waters offshore. And they've been documented to spawn in waters as deep as 150 feet. And after fertilization, the eggs are pelagic, which means they float out in open water, and they're dispersed by the water currents. The larvae form into benthic or bottom-dwelling juveniles that are about one inch long, so cute! And this is about 25 or 26 days after they hatch. Once they hatch, these larvae find their way over to the coastal areas where they live the juvenile phase of their lives in the roots, the prop roots of the red mangroves. And this is also typically happening that's coinciding with the start of the dry season in Florida during the winter time. And these fish live here until they've decided it's safe for them to go out in the world and or they've simply grown too large to suitably fit in this area anymore. And after that, they move back offshore where they take up residence in coral and artificial reefs. The feeding ecology is really, really neat with when it comes to Goliath grouper. They have these ginormous buccal cavities and you can see that they can open their mouths pretty big and they actually use suction to swallow their food whole. And they do have teeth, but they don't really chew or tear apart their prey in the same way that sharks do. And I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want to come face to face to this underwater. It's a little, uh, it's impressive, but a little scary. And the natural diet of Goliath grouper is about 70% crustaceans. And they also feed, Goliath grouper are very slow moving and some have, have gone as far to suggest that they're, they're lazy, but they go for slow moving prey, benthic or bottom dwelling crustaceans, stingrays, fish, and other invertebrates like octopus. octopus. And so there is that, you know, what they do, their hunting strategies, their feeding strategies from a biological perspective. However, since they are opportunistic predators, they will happily 
grab bait fish that's on the end of a line or grab a fisherman's catch that's on a hook or even snatch fish off a spear fisherman's spear. I wanted to take this moment to show you all this cool video provided to me by my colleague, Dr. Angela Collins, who did a study that determined that Goliath grouper change the way they feed depending on whether their food is mobile versus immobile. And if you look here, this is prey, it's dead prey that was placed on the top of a shipwreck. This is off the Southwest Florida coast. And the Goliaths are moving in and doing a little inspection, nudging it around, trying to decide whether or not they want it. And eventually this fish opens its mouth, sucks it in and eats its food. And I wanna just point out a couple of other things. I wanna mention that this is the video camera that was it was an unattended video camera affixed to the top of a shipwreck. And this Goliath that's in the center of the screen right now coming forth, it's, I wanna point out that he's trailing not just one, but two leaders, which indicates that this fish has in fact stolen things from fishermen. <laughs> so it is common and these interactions are increasing. But what this study revealed was that Goliath groupers they do change their feeding strategy depending on whether their food is free moving and alive or whether it's something that's dead. They do tend to chase more quickly after food that is swimming through the water column versus food that's lying in one place. There was a historical for Goliath grouper in Florida and there are reports dating back to these fish having been caught going back to the 1880s. And the highest landings were in Southwest Florida, which makes sense because if you think about what we just discussed with regard to their nursery habitat, their nursery habitat are red mangroves in estuarine areas. And the largest amounts of those are off the Southwest Florida coast, namely the area off of Everglades National Park, as well as 10,000 islands. So that is likely why there are the highest numbers of Goliath grouper in Southwest Florida. And fisheries for Goliath grouper have existed for centuries, both for sport as well as sustenance. And however, in the early days of the fishery, large numbers of adults weren't harvested. And they were also fished for trophy. And I'm sure some of you folks might be familiar with lots of photographs like these, su suggesting that this is an older photo. However, there are more recent photographs that can really, that demonstrate just how popular fishing for these animals were. And I just, I'd like to point out, because a lot of those historical photos are black and white, which we tend to associate being from a period of time that we might not really think about and affiliate ourselves with, but color photographs are really more within our lifetime. So I want to point these out because these are more recent examples. And the boom of fishing for these species really came in the 1970s and 80s when technology and GPS and electronics started to be more readily available and they made human beings better fishers and able to catch more. And so this species was fished out to the point of extinction, which led to an emergency closure in 1990, not just in Florida, but throughout the United States. And in 2006, NOAA did remove the species from its species of concern list. However, it is still listed on the IUCN's red list as a vulnerable species. Since Goliaths are very opportunistic feeders and as I mentioned, lazy, there have been this increasing number of reports of interactions between Goliaths, fishermen and divers. And there, is a, there are a lot of misconceptions floating around out there, one of them being that, quote, Goliaths are eating everything. And that has actually been proven incorrect by scientific research. And one paper in particular by Dr. Sara Frias Torres examined lots of historical data and put out these different model food webs. And in this figure on the right side, this first figure shows the perceptions that were held by commercial lobster fishermen, that Goliath grouper 
were preying upon spiny lobster to the point that the commercial fishermen were not really able to catch. The second food web goes back to that Goliath grouper are eating everything claim, which indicated that the Goliaths were eating not only spiny lobster in huge quantities, but they were also responsible for the decline of snapper and grouper species. However, scientific research based upon stable isotope analysis, the dentition or the design and layout of the Goliath's teeth, and actual gut content demonstrated that Goliath grouper prey was consisted largely of invertebrates, as well as slow moving bottom dwelling poisonous fish. And so this particular study helped dissolve some of those, or at least prove not quite correct, some of those misconceptions between fishermen and Goliath grouper. And I wanted to add a couple more things to, to consider when thinking about that conversation, if this the recovery of the species is in fact changing the ecosystem. And the first is this concept of shifting, shifting baselines, which we discuss quite a bit in, this, in the scientific community. One of the more popular and well-known examples is understanding the changes in Florida's coral reef in the 1980s versus now. And the example is the scientists and the divers who were underwater in the 1980s knew Carrie's Fort Reef, for example, as being this unbelievably lush garden of staghorn and elkhorn coral versus now individuals who snorkel and dive in that areas are really viewing a soft coral dominated and algae dominated system. And so the, I bring up this example because fishermen or divers who began practicing after 1990 were starting in a period where this fish was almost non-existent. And so as the species began to recover, they started to observe them more and see them more and leading to also more of those interactions. And therefore, it's been considered by a lot of people that these Goliaths are, quote, invaders or invasive species. However, that's not the case. They are a native reef fish species who are in population recovery. There also has been documented scientific studies that demonstrate that commercial fishing was in decline both during and after the lowest numbers of Goliath population. And that has been documented throughout Florida in particular the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And another study showed that this, the amount of saltwater fishing activity in the state has almost doubled in a 20 year period of time. And Dr. Jerry Alt documented this in, in this study in 2003 that there were about 15 to 20 million individual fishing trips in the 1980s and that became 25 to 30 million individual trips in the early 2000s. And so it's very easy to forget that our population is growing, saltwater access is growing, the availability and access to boats and fishing is growing. So therefore, that is likely trickling down and affect, affecting all of the fisheries. And there are several studies that agree with this that there's not a lot of really strong evidence that confirms that Goliaths themselves are lowering the reef fish populations. In fact, there are studies out of Florida State University that confirmed that on reefs that had Goliaths present, there were actually higher amounts of biodiversity and population of reef fish species with the Goliaths present versus reefs that did not have them. While you all watch this video, I wanna talk a little bit about the, some of the economic impacts that have been studied as a result of Goliath grouper spawning aggregations in Florida. This is a video that I put together when I last did a dive trip. So shameless plug to promote <laughs> diving in general, but also Goliath diving. And Goliath grouper are nocturnal group spawners and they favor new moon nights and early morning hours for the greatest amount of their spawning activity. And they've been known to travel quite long distances to spawn up to 500 kilometers or so. 
And after they spawn, they return to their home sites where they've exhibited very strong site fidelity. Goliaths really like high relief corals and artificial reef habitats. And in this, this time of year, August to September, late summer into early fall, Goliath scuba diving trips are incredibly popular. As you've seen from the different photos throughout the presentation and some of these videos, these fish are extremely neat underwater. They're very approachable, even some might suggest charismatic, and you can really observe them and they'll let you just hang out with them, which is just an unbelievable experience if you get the chance. And Lorenzen et al. in 2013 conducted a survey that documented that 80% of, excuse me, 87% of sightseeing dives find Goliath grouper encounters as positive. And a more recent economic study conducted by Schittler and Pierce in 2016 surveyed dive shops from Jacksonville to the Florida Keys. And it, this study demonstrated that recreational divers were estimated to pay to be willing to pay up to $200 for a trip where they might see up to 40 Goliaths. And the study also showed that non-Florida residents were willing to pay even more than Florida residents to do this. And this has been, this is actually quite similar to a lot of the work that has been valuing the worth of sharks and shark ecotours and shark diving, very similar that Goliaths are worth more alive than not. It takes a lot to try and better understand the Goliath grouper populations. And so this is accomplished through a couple of different approaches. And I wanna give a shout out to Angela Collins, who is my colleague. This is her right here. And I just wanted to also mention that this work that she is doing is done under permit since Goliath grouper are not allowed to be harvested or landed. And the study approaches consist of visual surveys, meaning divers in the water, observing, counting, measuring, etc. The use of conventional tags for, for tag and recapture studies, as well as acoustic tagging and using hydrophones. And the visual surveys has allowed for the confirmation of the habitat type preference as well as behavior. And that has resulted in understanding and knowing that Goliath grouper really do favor these high relief structures, particularly on the Southwest coast. And the acoustic tagging has allowed for a lot of data collection about their habitat and location and movement between sites. I like this example. This was from a study that Angela did a few years ago. And this was uh, featured a six foot long Goliath grouper that was caught in about 100 feet of water off of an artificial reef in Southwest Florida. The fish suffered from severe barotrauma or pressure injury but they placed an acoustic transmitter on him and re-released him safely. And they discovered through serendipity, this fish actually traveled about, gosh, 174 kilometers or 100 miles where he pinged off of a hydrophone off of Naples, another researcher's hydrophone. And oh, and I forgot to mention that once he was released, this fish stayed in the same area for about six months. And once he finally traveled south, he stayed in this area for about two weeks and then found out that the fish, once it left Naples, that this fish was traveling about 30 miles a day, which is pretty impressive when you consider a Goliath grouper that's up to 800 pounds as a maximum they're not exactly known for their sexiness or speed in swimming. So that's pretty cool that that fish was able to cover that kind of range. At this point, I wanna give a shout out to a joint citizen science effort between FWC and Florida Sea Grant called the, the Great Goliath Grouper Count. And this was a visual survey that started in 2010 as a regional effort in Southwest Florida. However, over the past 10 years, the initiative has, has expanded to include survey sites throughout the state. And this fish, excuse me, this fish count, it was designed to be a snapshot, very similar to the Audubon, Audubon Christmas bird count, 
that would allow for a long, a huge geographic range of data that might help inform a stock assessment for future management. And so every June in about a two week period, trained scientific divers collect a standardized set of data through underwater surveys at specific artificial and natural reefs throughout the state. And reef characteristics, water condition, and abundance and size estimates of Goliath grouper are recorded as well. This year would have been the 11th year of this particular event, and there was still some limited data collection where it was possible. So these, the, the graph that you're seeing is from the first 10 years of the Great Goliath Grouper Count. And you can see that it started out in Southwest Florida, but throughout the years, other regions participated as well. And the number of surveys per year ranged from 33 to 99, and the average was about 63. And participation and the viability of the surveys was largely dependent on local weather conditions as well as visibility. And so the data has confirmed the Goliath grouper presence not only in Southwest Florida, but the Keys, Southeast Florida, as well as the Northwestern Gulf and in the Panhandle. And our yellow bar, this is Southeast Florida. My predecessor joined in this effort in 2011. And I joined in in 2017 and have coordinated participation for Miami-Dade County. And I'm really pleased that our participants from Miami-Dade County's Durham have been probably the largest contributor of data for Miami-Dade County. And I've also since brought in partners at Biscayne National Park as well. So really cool shout out. And I think 2019, Miami-Dade County had the top number of surveys performed for the Great Goliath Grouper Count, so go us. This is the size distribution of Goliath Grouper recorded during each year of the Great Goliath Grouper Count. And I wanna point out that Goliath Grouper reach maturity at approximately three feet total length. So fish that are observed less than three feet in total length are likely subadults and therefore likely less than 10 years old. And I want to ask Ed now to throw out another poll, and I'd like you all to take your best guess as to how many Goliath grouper have been counted in the 11 years of the Great Goliath grouper count. Is it 1,999, 2,004, 2,114, or D, none of the above? So please use your mouse to indicate your, what you think the answer is and hit submit and we'll discuss the answer shortly. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. Great, thank you, Ed. All right, great. Thank you all for participating in that one. All right, so the big reveal. Well, the important, the most important piece of information probably that I can tell you is that 633 surveys have been completed and the cumulative underwater total was more than 290 hours. But the question that I just asked you was a little bit of a trick. And so for those of you who answered D, none of the above, you are correct. And the reason that that was a trick question is because it's complicated. And that's because during these surveys, it's mostly the same sites that are revisited every year. So that very many of the fish that are counted are likely the same fish counted before. So that's why it's the data that is are more important is actually the number of fish observed per year or the average per site per year, because that's actually more informative. But the answer for those of you who are really trying to guess the total, in all of the years, it's 2,114, but remembering that that is not likely 2,114 individual fish. So thank you guys for playing with that one was a trick question. But this has been a really great extension effort to collaborate with different agencies and different partners to 
get this coordinated data collection over a broad area in a relatively short time frame. And so this might be especially informative as future management options are discussed for this species. Now, when it comes to the Southeast Florida Goliath grouper comp population, this was, it's a little bit of a mystery. And I was actually talking about this the other day with Angela. We know that there are, there's quite a large spawning aggregation that occurs off of Jupiter on this coast every year. So where are those fish coming from and where are those babies going? And if you all are familiar, Jupiter is extremely close to the Gulf Stream, which is a warm current that runs north. And so if they're spawning and those spawn and those eggs are being released into the Gulf Stream, I'm really curious as to where those are ending up, as well as where are our local populations? Where are those babies coming from? And so I'm gonna just dangle this as a little carrot, but there you stay tuned, there might be opportunity for citizen science work to try and examine the absence presence of Goliath grouper babies in the future. So I'm gonna keep that carrot dangling. So please follow up with me offline if you're interested to learn about what that might be. Since harvest of this species is not permitted, it is still illegal to harvest or land the Goliath grouper, but fishing for catch and release is permitted, it's important to keep best practices in mind when handling these fish. The use of circle hooks is highly encouraged for easier release of the hooks. If the fish is caught, they must be kept in the water because that's really the best way to support that tremendous weight of the fish. Their skeletal structure can't really be adequately supported for a long period of time on a boat, so it has to be kept in the water. It's also highly recommended, if you know how to do so, to vent the fish or descend it if it is showing signs that it's experienced barrow trauma. And I put up this screenshot for a series that is posted on YouTube that was done by Florida Sea Grant, starring Angela and one of the other agents, Betty Stogler, that show different ways to safely vent fish as well as release them following pressure injury. And so you can just go to YouTube and type in Florida Sea Grant Barrow Trauma, and there's a series of five videos. They're only about a minute or a minute and a half long, and they're really well done. And also contacting any of these agents are a great way to familiarize yourself with these practices. If you're curious about learning more about Goliath Grouper, there are lots of resources available. In addition to different websites and papers, there is a portal that's housed by the Gulf of Mexico Fisheries Council. And I put the screenshot of what that looks like on the bottom left. And then there is the CEDAR stock assessment. And this is the most recent stock assessment paper. And it's, you know, light reading, 164 pages or so, but it's actually really interesting. They have them on lots of different fish, not just the Goliath grouper. There are tons of other resources, as I mentioned, I'm happy to send you links to them if you'd like. And before we finish up, I'm gonna ask Ed to launch one last really simple poll that I'm gonna ask you all to participate in. Please scroll to the bottom of the screen so that you can see all of those questions. There are only three. And as you all are finishing that, I do want to thank Angela Collins, who is just this, she's so smart, she's so nice, and she knows everything about Goliath. So I can also put you in contact with her if you have other questions, because this is Goliath Grouper, Fish and Fisheries are two of her main program areas, and she's my counterpart in Manatee County. And I also do want to mention that all of this work was, all the work where you see where she's next to a Goliath or working with a Goliath was done under permit. So please don't try this at home. All right, we're going to wrap that one up. Thank you. Great. And with that, I am done with my speech. So I'll turn it back over to you, Ed. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so very informative talk on a pretty fascinating 
fish. Um, it's now 1230, a little after 1230. So if you guys have to leave, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we will be staying on to answer questions from the chat. So if you guys have any questions from the presentation, please feel free to um, post those in the chat box and we'll, get, we'll go ahead and go through those. Um, again, thank you guys for tuning in to the webinar. Um, just as a reminder, it was recorded and we'll send the link out um, in a, the next day or two. Um, that way you can share that. Uh, and then please, uh, we hope you'll join us for an upcoming webinar. We will be posting those on social media. And uh, feel free to reach out to Anna if you want to be added to our, our email list for that. So Anna, if you want to pop your camera on to answer our questions, we have a few coming into the chat right now. Okay, I just did. And then my computer's giving me the black spiral of death. So I'm just going to leave it for now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That. <laughs> we can still yes, hear it. Let's go with the questions. <laughs> So um, let's see. So we have one from uh, Marsha. She wants to know what exactly is barotrauma. Okay, and I hope I'm getting a I'm getting a problem here, Ed. So I might lose yeah, you. Yeah, we see. Second. We yeah, we see your screen, but we can still hear you. So okay, um, you're still oh. online with us. Okay, I will keep going, and if I lose, I'll rejoin, or I'll you know what? I might just rejoin from my phone. But I'll start talking in the meantime. Okay. Barotrauma is simply a pressure injury. And if you're a diver, you learn about this because it's a physiological thing where if you come up from depth, you could have an air, you have, you, excuse me, you could have air in a pocket or in a space within your body. And if that air bubble bursts, you could suffer an injury. And the most common one of these is a, a ruptured lung. And so this unfortunately does happen with fish. Sorry, I'm trying to log in with my phone and do this at the same time. It's clearly not a, a good idea. Right. Although Ed, I think you, it's saying to let me in. So I might be able to, great. All right. All right, can you hear me on, oh. Yes, I got you on. You still there? Yes. Okay. I don't know how to use this. Can everybody hear me? Yep. It sounds like we're, we're good. There's no feedback from your other one, I think. Okay. All right. Well, sorry about that, everybody. And I don't know if you can see me, but I tried. And hi there. Pa pressure injuries. So when fish are brought up from depth, one of their most vital organs is what's known as a swim bladder. And that swim bladder can inflate or deflate to help keep them neutrally buoyant in the water, within the water. And so when the fish is caught and it's brought up rapidly, if, if you think about it, if you've ever gone swimming in the ocean and you blow bubbles, the bubbles, as they go to the surface, they get larger and larger and they might even burst. So if you think about that maybe happening in a trapped space, like a fish, like a balloon, think of the swim bladder and a fish like a balloon, that balloon, as it goes up, that air is expanding and expanding and that balloon could either burst or just get really big. And unfortunately, barotrauma can, is, can actually lead to the fish not surviving even after they've been released following catch. And so there are several different ways and techniques of not necessarily preventing this, but helping mitigate for it after the fish has been caught before it's released back to the bottom. And that goes, that's the same whether it's a goliath grouper or any other fish, if it's not in season or undersized. There are different techniques and different devices that you can use to help that fish get back to the bottom and increase its chance of survival. And if you can Google catchandrelease.org, as well as go back to that video, if you type in Florida Sea Grant on YouTube, Florida Sea Grant Barrow Trauma, that's a really good resource as well. Great, yeah, that's a good explanation. And thank you, Laszlo, for also providing a little bit more detail in the chat. Um, so we'll go to our next question or set of questions from Michael. We have two from him. He says, uh, the first one is, uh, do Goliath grouper larvae grow up in seagrass beds as well? Not likely, Michael. And I wonder if that's 
the Michael I'm thinking of it is, my cuño, yeah, not yeah. seagrass beds. They are pretty much exclusively within mangroves because that is where their food sources are and that also offers them <laughs> excuse me, that also offers them the greatest amount of habitat and structure to hang out in. All right, and his follow-up, or his second question is, um, have they been known to feed upon lionfish or prey upon lionfish? Oh, great question. Not naturally. When the lionfish invasion first started, there were experiments that involved feeding lionfish to other predators like Goliath grouper, sharks, and rays but it's not really been something that has been, they've not, Goliath grouper have not really naturally taken to that or adapted to that point yet. Although it would be really helpful if they did. Yeah. Uh, all right, thanks for those questions. Uh, let's move on to uh, Rob. Uh, he has a great question. What is one message that would be the most helpful to share with guests? Um, he's at Zoom Miami. Uh, he's thinking along the lines of chatting with people visiting our river monster style aquarium in the Amazon section or sharing the idea of eco tours where you simply visit them because these animals take so long to get big. But yeah, what would be your, um, you know, most helpful, you know, message to share with guests? I think stressing the fact that they are a native species, it's important because that's, I think, something that has gotten lost in some of the messaging in the last five or 10 years, especially as FWC has revisited this idea of reopening the fishery for Goliath grouper, but making sure that they are an important member of our marine ecosystem and that, yes, they take a long time to mature and reproduce, but that's why they are especially deserving of our protection because you know, unfortunately, man has proven to be the greatest predator of a lot of different species. And so now, in a lot of different ways, we're playing catch up to try and to try and manage that and address that effectively. So, and one other way, if, if you're talking about Goliath specifically, you know, I've never, there's also been some reports of Goliaths harassing divers, and that's also not really accurate. Oh, maybe I'm back online. Hey! Yeah, I just got that notification. Well, we can see you pretty well here. Um, let's see. Did I lose you on the volume? Okay. 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 Gotcha. Oh, perfect. Yeah, you're up. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Never, it's, it's always something with technology. <laughs> If you're talking about Goliath specifically, I think it's it's worth mentioning that they are just really cool to interact with. And that's also their approachability has made them pretty accessible to study. And that people are are valuing them and people come not only from throughout the state of Florida to Southeast Florida, Southwest Florida, but from other places in the country and even the world to observe those aggregations and to have that kind of experience, it's definitely, it's, it's surreal to be underwater and observe that because it really makes, it drives home the point that there's so many things that are larger than we are. And even if you're not a diver, I hope that maybe you felt that just a little bit with the video that I showed earlier. And they are an example, they are an example of where a highly managed fishery is starting to show success in the recovery of their population. Very good. Um, Rob has a follow-up question, actually. So would you agree that their impact on the ecology of the reefs is similar to uh, other top predators? For sure. They've actually, so in addition to fish species populations being very biodiverse and abundant, because goliaths favor these hidey holes and nooks and crannies in the reef, they actually will use their bodies and their movement to sweep out sediment and keep those little holes and crevices from filling up, especially when there's movement of sand from storms and stuff. So that actually helps keep the structure and the function of a natural reef way healthier than it would be if left to its own devices. Great. Um, Michael here has an anecdote, um, I guess, regarding his other question is, uh, I catch many Goliath rivers incidentally along red mangrove shorelines and offshore in Everglades National Park where they come up to the boat 
and they've eaten my sea trout or mangrove snapper. Yeah. So yeah, as she presented, you know, they're very likely to come up and interact with you as a fisherman. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, for those who know me, they might, they might be able to attest that I love food. And if you put out free food, I'll be the first one there. And Goliaths are, they're reasonably intelligent. And so, you know, again, if you put a plate of food in front of me in my room or put the same plate of food in front of me in the kitchen, I'm going to go for the one that's right there. And that's, that's what they're doing. It's not that they're trying to be a nuisance. They're just taking advantage. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rob uh, would like to say, so there are aquarists at Florida Aquarium and the North Carolina Zoo and aquarium that uh, are training groupers to do all kinds of cool stuff. That's yeah, that's pretty fascinating. Any, um specific training yeah what kind of cool stuff I'm rob? Too. maybe rob you could follow up with um specifics um and while you do that i'm going to move on to barbara she has a, a more personal question for anna since she, you featured it much in your presentation is are you still diving i'm assuming oh, yes. during yeah during our covid times yes absolutely barbara i've been diving exclusively a couple times with the national park service where i'm still a volunteer and I also work with them as partners, but that has all been COVIDly approved <laughs> and of course under stricter guidelines. And I also regularly dive with my dive buddy, uh, usually in the Keys on the weekends. And I'll actually, I have a trip this weekend for Goliath Group responding up in Jupiter. So fingers crossed, it looks like it's gonna be really good weather. And of course, since my camera died, I'm sure it's gonna be the most epic dive I've ever had because I don't have a camera. <laughs> that's the way that happens usually. Yeah, um, yeah that's great. Uh, so yeah, Michael, so they have a fantastic color pattern. Are there any studies that reveal how that works in the environment that they grow up in as well as you know where they thrive in as well? That's really interesting. And the color pattern, yeah. Ed, can you screenshot that for me? Because sure. When I rejoined, it didn't show me all the comments. To answer Michael's question, I don't think so. Aside from that, they do seem to blend in, particularly when there are areas that are, that don't have a whole lot of different color to them. But other than that, I'm not sure, aside from a natural adaptation, I'm not sure otherwise, but they also do blend into mangrove prop roots, that's for sure. Yeah. Um... Okay, so Chuck would like to know, do Goliath grouper, uh, he says thump other groupers, I, I don't know if he means Trump, or other groupers, or is this only used towards divers and other large threats? I think what Chuck is referring to is the thump or the bark. Oh yeah, okay. And that's when Goliath groupers, it's actually pretty scary. If you don't know what, it's still scary even when you know what it is, but especially when you don't. And that's when Goliath actually pump water over their gills with a lot of force and a lot of a lot of volume and a lot of force and it it creates this it's more a sensation than it is a sound but they actually like move the water and it's like it's an underwater bark and that is their way of saying hey i'm agitated get out of my face so i've only ever observed it when there are other divers in the water but i would imagine that is probably a general natural call to say get away from me for whatever reason cool. but yeah definitely they're generally not they're not particularly aggressive towards divers that's their that's their warning and you know unfortunately you do hear that sometimes on some of these trips but that's their way of saying hey i'm in my little hole i'm here please don't bother me gotcha so rob is following up here with um his training um uh the things that he's heard as far as the training of these Goliath groupers. So uh, they've been trained to shift from the main aquarium into the holding area for weights, medical procedures and observations. So like target training um, and station training, like holding at a specific spot for three to four minutes so that the keepers can do their projects. Um, he said he'll, he'll email you some more stuff too. Okay. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. To, to train them to kind of be more, um, you know, approachable and to, to allow them to, yeah them up cool that, that's interesting robin it actually doesn't surprise me when i was a volunteer diver at the national aquarium in baltimore the great majority of the larger animals that are on exhibit are also spot trained and target trained and it you know they they 
the Aquarius and the staff there, they, they categorize it as this larger thing, part of animal husbandry, which not so much for the show of the aquarium patrons, but really to make it so that they're able to access the animals, not just for feeding, but if they need to move the animal from one exhibit to the other, or if they have to get uh, checked out by a vet or treated, it makes it a little bit easier to work with them. I thought you meant they were being trained to go get a beer from the fridge or something. Like that, <laughs> yeah, that's which, what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> which would still be really neat. <laughs> yeah, they're still, yeah, he says they are stinking smart. Yeah, and, and I think we agree with that. And, you know, who knows what other things can, they can, um, we can find out about them in terms of their training. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, he says the beer thing is next, so he'll suggest it. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, this has been a really great, you know, conversation about it post uh, her great talk. So we appreciate you guys joining us. Um, if you do have any other follow-up questions, I did provide Anna's email in the chat. So feel free to reach out. Um, and we really appreciate you guys joining us and, and engaging in this uh, conversation. Um, we will be posting our upcoming talks um, at the beginning of, of October. And we hope to see you guys again soon. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for your patience with the technical. <laughs> we just got to see you at different angles. And <laughs> oh <my. laughs> always but, something. Uh, all good. Yeah, always something. But thanks so much, guys. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.